years after the oil spill, the fishermen of the deep south are still in deep trouble. This is the marina, this is the boats. Just sitting here, sitting here rusting away, rusting away. At the marina in Point Alahash, on the east side of the mighty Mississippi, the fleet is in decay and the community is in despair. Now, this is all brand new change I bought right before the oil spill. All that's got to be replaced now. And this is another problem we have. Byron Enkelade is president of the Louisiana Oysterman Association. This should be out working, shouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. Right now, this marina would be booming. I mean, you're talking about boats from Texas all the way to Mississippi and Alabama would be in here. It's horrible. It's heartbreaking. It, it, it almost makes you don't want to come down to the marina. Byron, they say there's no oysters left here. What do you say to that? It's, it's the facts. I mean, there's no little oysters growing, spatting. So, you know, our future is very uncertain. I mean, there is no oysters. In April 2010, the deep water horizon drilling rig exploded with a loss of 11 lives. Oh yeah, there's your, there's your oil line right there, that's it. Wow, that oh shit. That shit, look at this, Rick, wow. See that platform out there? Yeah. Initially, BP played down the spill, describing the environmental impact as modest. But over three months, nearly five million barrels of crude oil spewed into the Gulf. We got uh, various captain of boat, Buck's captain, Lars is captain of boat. With their boats tied up, the fishermen are struggling. It's been rough, man, really, it's been rough. And just trying to hold on to these people pay us our money, you know, so we can get on ourselves on our feet, get our family straight. The last couple of years, it's been bad. <laughs> There's nothing to do, no kind of work. No work. Camp, no oysters. This is a fishing community, and this is what we do. And if we're not fishing, there's nothing else to do. We don't have big industries down here. This community, you know, rises and falls on, on our estuaries being healthy. When BP made a commitment to the Gulf, we knew it would take time, but we were determined to see it through. Thousands of environmental samples from across the Gulf have been analyzed by independent labs under the direction of the U.S. Coast Guard. I'm glad to report all beaches and waters are open for everyone to enjoy. Everything is fine. The Gulf is recovering. That's what you hear from BP. And that's not true? No, it's not true. You see all these boats in this marina? Look at them. Take a look. Why are they not working? We're at ground zero here. If people were back to work, what all these boats doing parked in this marina? Crude oil wasn't all that polluted the Gulf. BP sprayed millions of litres of Corexit, a controversial dispersant to break up the slick. Corexit 9527, used in the initial days of the spill, is regarded as an acute health hazard by the US Environmental Protection Agency. In the Exxon Valdez disaster in Alaska, the dispersant was linked to serious human health complaints. The peoples are really sick here and folks need to know how sick and how serious this is. This is a serious matter. The spill has kept community worker Glenda Perryman very busy. She's taking me to visit some of the cleanup workers now suffering from ill health. What is the problem with them? Um, they having breathing problems, headaches, um, breaking out in rashes, asthma, they can't breathe. In Loosedale, Mississippi, we meet former cleanup worker Don Street. He's just been given the results of a blood test. See here, I got 75% chemical, this chemical. Uh, it said he has benzene in his blood. He has aphthobenzene. I don't know Don isn't yet words. sure what the results Siren. mean, but he does know that since he worked on the spill, he suffered mysterious symptoms. And I'm breaking out with rash and stuff. I got it all over my arms, all across here, on my legs. Then I got, I got spots like 
Don was one of the army of workers drafted in by BP. Not long after he was laid off, the symptoms began. I had headaches and I itched a lot and it just constantly itching. You, you scratch so much you just start bleeding. And you constantly scratch all through the night while you're sleeping. I don't know if I'm living or going to die because I don't know what the chemicals are going to cause. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's what I'm afraid of, really. We head across town to meet another sick worker. Keep your head up, uh, keep in touch with us, let us do the fighting for you. Well, we should appreciate it because uh, a lot of us are at, just at the dead end, we don't know where to, where to turn to. Uh. Robert Kemp cleaned the spill for six months. And my job was to go, get on the boat and take new booms out and to pull the old boom up. At $14 an hour, the money was welcome, though conditions were tough. We had nowhere to sit on the boat. Don't have room to put the boom on and you sit on the boom. And that's how I, I caught it. I laid back on it. It got into an open pore in my back and it's gonna be in there for the rest of my life. His doctors have diagnosed Mercer disease, a potentially fatal infection which shows up as painful lumps under the skin. Robert says he was trained in the use of personal protective equipment, or PPE. But some days, he claims, the workers were told to keep the safety gear off. They give you all this training for the PPE, but when you get out there and you go ask them, where's the PPE? They look at you like, uh, <laughs> you trying to get fired, there's no such thing. Go to work. Have you received any compensation? Not one dime. Why not? They denied me. They said that the infection did not come from their polluted water. So where does it leave you, Robert? The uh, majority of the time sitting here at home. They are gonna pay for this. One way or the other, they gotta pay. They wants to use millions of dollars to advertise and say everything is fine. Everything is not fine. Everything is not fine. Everything is bad in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama. Everything is bad. It's really bad. It's people dying. We're here at Fouchon Beach at the bottom of Bayou Lafouche, right above the Gulf of Mexico. I take a walk with environmental scientist Wilma Subra, and it's not long before she spots what she's looking for. We have a very large tar ball that's washed on shore. And this is again two years since the BP crude spill in the Gulf of Mexico, still washing on shore. The tar balls are formed by accumulations of crude oil mixed with dispersant. Inside they're highly toxic and full of potentially deadly bacteria. If somebody broke that up, they could get what? What would happen to them? And they would first get respiratory impacts and skin rashes headaches, nausea, and then it could develop into long-term chronic impacts, decreased lung function, cardiovascular impacts. So you don't want to open it up? No, I don't. But there could be a much wider threat to human health. Have traces of oil got into the food chain? Absolutely. We've sampled shrimp, crabs, oysters, and fin fish, as well as some mussels and we are finding the petroleum hydrocarbons and the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons in these tissue samples, and we're finding it in larger quantities over a one-year period after the spill so that it's bioaccumulating, in particularly the oysters. Researchers from Louisiana State University have discovered a significant increase in deformities and infections in Gulf sea life. Wilma is worried. What do you see at the end of the tunnel? I see very long-term damage to the environment and human health, and therefore it's going to have an impact on generations to come. You couldn't stand right here back in the old days. There were so many machines running around here and trim going. We used to fill 10, 12 tractor trailers a day over here. In Louisiana, Dean Blanchard is the seafood king. But since the spill, his empire has crumbled. 
How long can you keep on going for, Dean? Not much longer. Not much longer. His company supplied more than 10% of all the shrimp consumed in the United States. What's going through your mind now? Oh, I just wishing it would all be working, where well, we could be making money and get everything back to normal again. Just wondering if we're ever going to live long enough to see normal again, you know? You work all your life expecting things to happen a certain way, and then all of a sudden a company like BP comes and changes everything, you know? It's BP's decision to use dispersants that really makes him angry. Turn right left. The chemicals remove the oil from the surface by breaking it down and spreading it through the water column. They hired a bunch of shrimpers and they'd go out there and look for the oil. And they'd hear airplanes come in in the middle of the night and then the next morning they'd go back to the spot where the oil was and it was nothing but bubbles and soap. They'd spray enough chemicals that it would sink the oil. All BP wanted to do was hide it, you know, out of sight, out of mind, you know. It don't matter that it's all sitting on the bottom of the ocean, killing everything. I've thought about going to England and try to kill some of them people from BP, but that still won't bring back the fish and the shrimp. BP is going to be here until the oil is gone, and the people and businesses are back to normal. We've agreed to create a $20 billion claims fund, administered independently, and it's at no cost to taxpayers. There's no doubt the spill has cost BP dearly. From its claims fund, the company has already dished out $6 billion in compensation. On top of that, it's now finalised a new $7.5 billion deal to settle one of the biggest class actions in history. But critics say the claims process so far hasn't always been fair. You have to have lived for 60 days within a half mile of the beach. And in Louisiana, the only beach we have is where we're standing in Grand Isle. And then they limited to only about six or seven health impacts, where there's some 30 health impacts associated with the crude, as well as some 30 impacts associated with the dispersant. So they slimmed it down to almost nothing, so the people most impacted won't even qualify and the end game is if you don't qualify, you have to sue to get damages. And these people cannot afford to sue. Over a gumbo dinner, I meet Stuart Smith, a New Orleans lawyer. He's representing more than a thousand cases against BP. Earth, they capped the well, they started opening all the beaches. And I was shocked because I knew there was still oil in the Gulf. So I called my expert and I said, how are they opening the beaches? So he called the, pub, the public health service in Mississippi that had just opened the beach, and he asked the guy, he says, well, how are y'all opening the beaches? And the guy goes, well, we did it, we tested it. He said, well, what kind of test did you run? He said, oh, the same test we always run, fecal coliform. <laughs> Stewart's been litigating against the big oil companies for 25 years. He's highly critical of BP's handling of the crisis. BP has not done the right thing, and they're not doing the right thing. Uh, um, they, they remind me of George Bush with Mission Accomplished. Uh, they, they're, they're not even close to getting the environment cleaned up the way it should be and compensating all of these people. Why not? Because they just don't want to spend the money. You know, I think a decision was made early on uh, at the highest levels of the White House to do whatever they could possibly do to save British Petroleum. And so once that decision was made, you can see uh, the actions since then have flowed uh, directly from that uh, decision. Um, President Obama pretending to swim in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, making these statements that 70 percent of the oil is gone and that everything's safe was just simply a lie. Is it as bad as what it was two years ago? It's worse. Why? Because it, it the, the the, the oil is starting to mess up the plankton and the stuff that the small shrimp and the fish eat. And, and then it's, it's going up the food chain, you know. If you look at what happened in Alaska, it took five years before it, it really got real bad. So we expecting the same thing to happen here. I don't see why it'd be no different. In 2010, 
I visited the scene of the Exxon Valdez spill. Two decades on, I found the people there are still suffering. But 20 times the amount of oil spilled in Alaska ended up in the Gulf of Mexico. It may be many years before the real impact is felt. This is not Mother Nature we're dealing with. This is a man-made disaster. BP needs to step up and do what they said. I am gonna make you whole again. I take full responsibility for what have happened to these fishing communities. We want to see that happen. We are still waiting to see that happen.